A handsome mid an isle of wondrous beauty, crouching over a grave, an ancient sorrowful mother, once a queen now lean and tattered, seated on the ground. Her old white hair drooping disheveled round her shoulders, at her feet fallen an unused royal harp. Long silent, she too long silent, mourning her shrouded hope and air. Of all the earth, her heart most full of sorrow because most full of love. Yet a word, ancient mother, you need crouch there no longer on the cold ground with forehead between your knees. Oh, you need not sit there veiled in your old white hair so disheveled. It was an illusion. The son you love was not really dead. The Lord is not dead. He is risen again, young and strong in another country. Even while you wept, there by your fallen heart by the grave, what you wept for was translated, passed from the grave. The winds favored and the sea sailed it, and now with rosy and new blood moves today in a new country. Good evening and welcome to Philly Loves Poetry. My name is Charles Harkins Carr. I'm the host of Philly Loves Poetry. Uh, which is a collaborative uh, effort by the Moonstone Arts Center of Philadelphia and Philly Can. The focus of our programs uh, is to give our audiences an appreciation for the rich culture of poetry in the city of Philadelphia. There are over 50 organizations, not including colleges and universities, that promote uh, the love of poetry in our community, either by offering poetry readings sponsoring pe special poetry events, uh, running poetry workshops for poets at all stages of their development, and uh, print uh, both books uh, and journals of poetry, both online and in print. So on any given day or night in Philadelphia, somewhere there's poetry uh, being read and, and in this city because we have such a rich culture of poetry. So uh, tonight, the theme of our, of our show, and you see my, my bow tie, green bow tie, uh, is Irish poetry. Uh, of course, on March 17th, we celebrate St. Patrick's Day. So I have two really remarkable guests who are with me tonight that are going to be discussing and reading poetry, both Irish and Irish American poetry. First to my right, Natalie Anderson. Natalie's first book, Following Fred Astaire, won the 1998 Washington Prize from the Word Works. Natalie's second uh, book of poem, Crawlers, received the 2005 McGovern Prize from Ashton uh, Poetry Pre Press. And her third, Quiver, was published in 2011 by Penstruck Press. Natalie's poems have appeared in such journals as the Atlanta Review, Double Take, Natural Bridge, The New Yorker, and The Recorder. Natalie has authored libretta for three operas, The Black Swan, Suki in the Dark, and an operatic version of Arthur Conan Doyle, A Scandal in Bohemia, all in collaboration with the composer Thomas Whitman and the orchestra uh, 2001, if, excuse me, in Philadelphia. A 1993 Pew Fellow, Natalie serves currently as poet in residence at the Rosenbach Museum and Library. Natalie teaches at the Swarthmore College where she is a professor in the Department of English Literature and directs the program in creative writing. Uh, what Natalie doesn't include in her biography is that she runs a, a, a listserv and has done so for several years uh, that really informs uh, people in our community and in our region of all these wonderful poetry events uh, that take place throughout the year and throughout the, um, throughout the community. So we're indebted to you for that. Uh, I, I at least received five to six <laughs> announcements of poetry events and readings. Uh, I would love to go to them all, but I, there's just not enough time. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Natalie. And next to Natalie is Cassie McDonald. Cassie serves as a hearth keeper of Bridget's House in Camden, New Jersey. Where, facil where she facilitates a twice-monthly writing circle 
organizes readings, workshops, and other writing arts events, and creates neighborhood murals as part of the Poetry Liberation Front Poetry to the People. Cassie has been a featured reader at Fergie's, Big Blue Marble Bookstore, and 11-1 Gallery in Camden. And she is always game for an open mic, even an unscheduled one on a moving train. Her chapbook, Use Your Words, is currently looking for a home. So welcome, Kathy. Thank you. So uh, Irish poetry, Irish American poetry is such a, an enormous subject. And, and spans so much time and so many great artists that it's difficult in one program to do justice to it, and probably even not in two programs. Uh, but what I would really like to focus on first is what you see as Irish in Irish American poetry. What, what, what are those qualities, and where would one find that if, if one was searching for it uh, among American poets? Go to you, Natalie, first. Well, I'm happy to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, interestingly, I guess I would say right at the moment, I'm in the process of um, putting together an anthology of poets who are associated with the um, American organization, the American Conference for Irish Studies. Mm -hmm. And most of the people in this organization um, are scholars of Irish literature but also are poets. They've come to, um, to, be in, uh, to write in response to um, the matter of Ireland, the politics of Ireland, the literature of Ireland, the landscape of Ireland. And um, it's those poets that I think of first when I think of Irish-American writers. Um, most are of Irish heritage, and that's what brought them to Irish studies in the first place. Um, but the diversity of writers, uh, of this group of writers, is um, just immense. Uh, so that it's hard to say that any of these um, poets write in the same way or on the same topic. Um, I brought with me uh, Dan Tobin's um, collection of Irish American poetry which begins with the beginning of the country and goes up through the present day. And he makes a case that a lot of people of Irish descent write about travel, write about travel by sea, write about displacement. Um, but I think that that's true of most immigrants, most children of immigrants, so I'm not sure that I would make a special case for Ireland um, in that way. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that there's a great love in Irish poetry for nature. And so um, I see that translated in contemporary Irish American poetry to an emphasis on ecological perspectives. So, but I still think that diversity rather than uniformity rules with Irish American poetry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Cassie, how would you respond to that? from your experience? <clears throat> well, I don't really take a, a scholar's approach, um, mm -hmm. but more the, the poet who's followed my bliss yeah. all my life right. in discovering poets. And um, I really think it, my feeling about Irish poetry, apart from poetry generally, um, is uh, you know a couple of the things that Natalie raised about, about being, having this special connection to the earth. I don't know if that's, um, it's my experience. I don't know if it's unique to Irish uh, poets. But I know that uh, when my mother and I had the good luck to go to Ireland in 2002, which was about 100 years after her grandmother emigrated here. Mm -hmm. So it was a really very meaningful journey for us. Um, I had the idea as I met people there and I encountered poets and other artists that to say Irish poet was almost redundant mm -hmm. because there was a sense with all Irish people that we encountered of this, this kind of, um, well, one, there's the music and the language itself. So anything someone says starts to sound like poetry right away. Uh, we, we encountered an old man uh, on our journey uh, in a little village and he, this toothless old man who came up to me and said, do you take a drink? <laughs> like that, I said, well, that, there you go, there's a poem. Mm -hmm. 
But, uh, but it was certainly that sense of poetry being integrated with life. And whatever uh, you know, the poet was expressing was really arising out of their experience and their life mm -hmm. on the land, with the family, with the history, uh, and the present moment. Mm -hmm. you know, th th not tied in the past, but, but certainly the past is very much a part of the, the experience of the present moment. Mm. Um, and I was very moved by that. And it's something that uh, continued to be important in my own understanding of my own uh, writing and understanding other poets, the sense that um, the poet isn't just for writing, but for being in life in a certain way. That that it's a it's a role, it's a it's a responsibility, mm -hmm. and uh, you know when Seamus Heaney you know in that his book The Redress of Poetry, where he really speaks to uh, what what uh, the place of the poet in culture and, mm -hmm. and in the world um, was very important to me too, and I think that seems to be for me a particularly Irish um, sensibility that mm -hmm. uh, because of um, the history of violence, well, and that's mm -hmm. everywhere too. Yeah. But, but because coming out of the history and conflict, um, what is the poet for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd underscore that too, that history of conflict and not just political conflict, but also the issues of hunger, mm -hmm. the, um, the aftermath of the famine. And I do think that that sense of social responsibility follows these poets to the United States. I shouldn't say follow mm -hmm. these poets, like most of the poets that we're talking about as Irish American mm -hmm. are not themselves born in Ireland. Mm -hmm. but, um, but there is a sense of having some kind of responsibility beyond the self, mm -hmm. even as you're expressing what it means to live in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And um, that heritage of sorrow, I think, continues to, to inflect their work it's interesting that you started off with the Whitman poem where he's saying, Ireland, you woman, you impoverished woman, you mm -hmm. sad woman, you don't have to be sad and impoverished anymore because you now have an arm, you might say, in the new world. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that arm in the new world feels the, the continuing um, grip mm -hmm. of the history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I think people that aren't necessarily poets or followers of, of poet poems uh, see in Irish poems very much a response to uh, the situation that we had as a people, a colonized people, essentially, mm -hmm. um, and how we have used the language as uh, our weapon mm -hmm. uh, when we didn't have weapons. Uh, you know, against our colonizers. So, uh, do you see so much of Irish poetry is so steeped in the political turmoil? Mm -hmm. When you think of you know 38 years of the troubles, mm -hmm. and how much poetry uh, you know came from that. How do you locate yourself though within this tradition as a poet? Mm -hmm. uh, n not just the you know, response to political, but you know, the things that you had talked about, which is this mm -hmm. affinity and love of nature and the land. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that for myself, the line of influence would come through the word more than the land. Um, I'm Irish American too, but my family came to the to this um, continent in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. And so Although I've traveled in Ireland, I can't say that I have that direct link mm -hmm. with um, a, a, a just barely remembered past. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more a matter of pride mm -hmm. than it is a matter of experience. On the other hand, that love for gab, <laughs> the, the story that won't stop, the aside that turns into the main um, topic, uh, mm -hmm. those are things that I appreciate and I think that I find them in my own work and hope I can do more with them, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. And Cassie, you've been involved in so much in the development of Camden, development of a cultural mm -hmm. uh, forum in Camden for mm -hmm. what you're doing and also uh, for your affiliations with other organizations in Camden to yeah. some of the struggles 
of Camden mm -hmm. as a city, uh, racially, socially, economically, and how does that how does that seep into your and inform your poetry? Hmm. Well, um, I think it's like wine, you know, that takes its influences from the ground and the air and the. I would add for a poet the sounds mm -hmm. um, of a place and um, you, you really, if you have any uh, empathy at all, you can't help but be formed mm -hmm. by what's happening, you know, in your environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a place like Camden, for me, or what it really demands is honesty. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's always been, for me, the bottom line with poetry. Mm -hmm. It's the one, one place in, in my life, I can say, where um, I've always had to be honest when mm -hmm. I write. Mm -hmm. So um, it actually, I think Camden has made me a better poet mm -hmm. because uh, of the very struggles that you're describing. Um, but it's, it's energy, the energy that comes from a struggle which sort of like shakes off the things that are not important mm -hmm. and uh, it helps you to really get to the heart. And, uh, and there's a lot of pain as well, you know, and so in some ways there's that line you can draw between, you know, a, a person who has grown up in Camden and I didn't grow up there, so there's a lot of struggle that I, I never experienced firsthand, mm -hmm. thankfully. Um, but, you know, going back into the, my blood, you know, the Irish blood, that it's really surprising, you know, I found going back when we were in Ireland, how I connected, though I didn't mm -hmm. know anyone. You know, we went to the, the you know, the place where my great-grandmother came from, and I said, all oh, these people look like my family. I can't believe them. Look at their faces. It could have mm -hmm. been my grandmother. Uh, and waking up the night before we left and just crying and crying out of a dream because I was leaving. And I didn't understand how, you know, that connection could be there after three generations. Mm -hmm. But it was there. Yeah. So. Um, I would say yeah. I have this, this similar experience when mm -hmm. you leave. Like you're leaving again, and mm -hmm. uh, and you you know you have an attachment, you know, mm -hmm. especially when you can locate, you know, where your heritage is mm -hmm. from. When you see, you know, artifacts of graves, and mm -hmm. and you meet and talk to people, it's uh, it, you know, it's it's really an experience to go to Ireland. Mm -hmm. Period. Whether you're Irish or not, it's such mm -hmm. a a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. But when you leave, there is a, an emotional. Uh, mm -hmm. Be, uh, dimension to it, a absolutely, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's tough, uh, you know, to do so. But nonetheless, you know, it happens. You know, when we think of we, when I guess people think of Irish, Irish and Irish American poets, they generally think in terms of men. You know, I mean the Yeatses, and of course, you you you, you mentioned Seamus Haney and 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 others, but there is a you know. A growing population of great women poets mm -hmm. that I think most people, you know, have never heard of, never read, and so could you speak to that? Sure. Um, I think most Americans have perhaps never heard of them, but most Americans couldn't tell you two poets from England at the moment mm -hmm. who are uh, well known there. So mm -hmm. I I think that it's as much a matter of that. Um, Atlantic Ocean divide at, uh, that it's just hard for us to know um, unless we have a particular interest in it. Um, it's also true that although um, previous generations of um, Irish women didn't have that platform as much, uh, nevertheless um, Oscar Wilde's mother was known as Esperanza she was an extremely popular and um, politically impassioned poet, 
And so um, most people wouldn't know that either, although they would recognize the name of Wilde. Mm -hmm. So at the time, she was extremely influential. And, and we've, you know, it's time and distance. There you go. But I'm, I made a list of some of the, um, the writers um, who have been especially uh, significant in Ireland in the last maybe 50 years. Um, maybe that's more time than I really mean, but uh, Eileen Nguilanine, uh, uh, sorry, I mispronounced her last name, Nguilanine, um, Ivan Boland, who I think you're going to read a little bit of in a moment, Maeve McGuckian, um, Nuala Nagonal, who writes in Irish and is translated by all of the most um, famous contemporary writers uh, in Ireland, um, Mary O'Malley, Rita Ann Higgins, Paula Meehan, who has just come uh, off of being the equivalent of the Poet Laureate of um, Ireland. I think Eileen uh, Nguilanoin is the significant, the, um, the poetry professor there, the, um, mm -hmm. the uh, Poet Laureate at the present moment. Moya Cannon, Siobhan Campbell, Katie Donovan, Vona Grork, uh, Sarah Berkeley, Sinead Morrissey, and I I'll stop there, but um, these are very powerful women and they're, um, they're very well read in Ireland. They're famous in mm -hmm. Ireland. So I think that it's our um, limitations and our loss that we don't know so much. Mm -hmm. um, and part of also a, a heritage in our country and in that country where the men get the mic more often than the women, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But um, I wanted to mention with this list that um, uh, Nuala Nagonal, um, Mary O'Malley, uh, Moya Cannon, uh, Vona Grork, these are all people who have been in residence for a full semester at Villanova during the past several years where they mm -hmm. have a writer in residence. Sometimes it's a poet, sometimes it's a fiction writer or a playwright, sometimes it's a woman, sometimes it's a man, sometimes from the north of Ireland, sometimes from the Republic of Ireland. But these are, are people that we've had the opportunity to mm. meet and know in Philadelphia, which is really exciting. Um, I'm sure that our audience knows that this is a city to which many Irish people have come mm -hmm. and um, the, uh, Irish Studies program at Villanova has been going on now for um, quite some time and uh, has um, brought together not just young people who want to know more about their heritage, but people from the community here who are eager to be involved in that literary heritage. There's a number of, uh, of those poets and, and male poets yeah. who uh, occupy uh, you know, positions in major universities yes. and therefore obviously can have a direct impact yes. upon, uh, you know, this, the Irishness of, of Irish American yeah. poetry. Yeah. What do you see is unique, if, or is there something unique when, when we say this, the, the women's voice of, of yeah. Ireland? Do you want to speak about that first? Because well, I would just say the in the specific case of Evan Boland, who yeah. was one of the first Irish women poets I learned of, um, just the fact that she was able to speak to the domestic experience yes. as a poet and uh, bring that into the realm of, of poetry that um, to elevate uh, the woman's domestic life. Mm -hmm. And that felt to me really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and also having this wonderful, you know, wider view that she could interweave, you know, of the culture and the politics and the history, mm -hmm. but also really bringing it to the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that you wouldn't see many male poets do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she's like um, Adrian Rich, written very powerfully in prose as well about her own upbringing, about the difficulty in being a woman, I guess in the 50s in school, where all of the people that you were taught to read mm. were, um, were men. Mm. And for that matter, not especially Irish men. Mm -hmm. But um, it, there was an assumption, and uh, this goes back to that uh, Whitman poem that you read too. There's a long um, tradition in Ireland of thinking of Ireland as a woman 
And as a woman who needs help, a woman who can't manage on her own, mm -hmm. of needing to be defended, and um, this uh, comes especially out of the Jacobite songs of the 17th century, I guess, where um, it was a way of hiding your politics to uh, write what looked like a love song, but really was saying, I am defending my nation. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and Boland talks eloquently about how uh, that's a terrible position for the woman poet to be placed in, mm -hmm. because it looks as if you can't do anything for yourself Mm -hmm. that you need to be defended. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that she took a lot of um, inspiration from Adrienne Rich, as a matter of fact, uh, in thinking about how that could be changed. And uh, all women poets in Ireland these days owe a great debt to her, I would say. And mm -hmm. she's currently at Stanford? She, yeah. She's there half a year okay. each year, yes. And it's a little ironic because if you look further back in Ireland's past and how many powerful women yes. there are in, in the history of Ireland, uh, you know, military leaders, political mm -hmm. leaders. Pirates. Uh, pirates, <laughs> yes. I did that for Halloween one year. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Granny O'Malley. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, the, and, and that you would come to this past where those voices aren't heard. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, it's just the cycles, I suppose, of. Yeah of human history, but um, you know, it's really inspiring to reach a little further back. And myself taking Bridget as the patron mm -hmm. for my writer's house, because the, the goddess Bridget was the patron of poets mm -hmm. uh, and of blacksmiths and, and all of those uh, transformative arts. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is also moving, you know, in the woman poet and the male poets uh, kind of psyche this sense of women is very powerful, and some might find that scary, <laughs> and others might find it inspiring, uh -huh. you know, but I think that's a, a part that, uh, and maybe that's another thing that's a little, you know, sort of unique about Irish poetry, mm -hmm. that, that stream of really strong feminism. Mm -hmm. So that's a choice that you made, I mean, mm -hmm. in terms of calling it Bridget's House. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could you tell us just a, a little bit about mm -hmm. how that all came to be, and it's, <laughs> Affiliation. Uh, you know, when my mother Father and I Doyle. were in Sligo, we met a fellow in the pub, and I was I was telling him a story, and I, I said, I think I'm making this story longer than it has to be. And he said, he was scandalized. He <laughs> said, no story is as long as it could be. <laughs> so there's not really a good way to tell that story in a short way, but, but I started uh, attending Sacred Heart Church in Camden in 2001, and um, sort of drawn in by the, you know, what was happening in the parish, which had a very Irish flavor, to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, owing to its pastor, Michael Doyle, but also uh, a very, um, you know, uh, active social justice uh, component, um, but also the neighborhood itself really sort yeah. of animated me um, yeah. with a particular energy of, I felt um, something creative, you know, trying to, to come forth, you know, or that was already there, really. Um, so uh, when I decided I'd like to actually reside in the neighborhood, um, I, that's, and I took a pilgrimage to Kildare uh, mm -hmm. to see where Bridget, both goddess and saint, uh, came from. Uh, I realized she'd been sort of stalking me for years. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that that was really um, uh, what I was trying to bring into the house, both the creativity of writing and other arts, the, the energy of yeah. reconciliation yeah. and peace, uh, and the hospitality, which is mm -hmm. a very, another very important stream in Irish thought and philosophy, the, yeah. the really radical hospitality. Yeah. Well, so you've done really wonderful work mm -hmm. there. And I mean, as well as Father Doyle and Sacred mm -hmm. Heart, I mean, they've really become a beacon mm -hmm. uh, in, in Camden. And it, you know, I think there's great hope when you hear the story and, and mm -hmm. the things that you're doing. So it's wonderful to discuss Irish poetry. I think <laughs> it's even better to hear Irish poetry. <laughs> so I would like you to, to read some, some poems for us. So I'll start with Natalie and you can discuss why you. you selected certain things. Yes, so I wanted to start with two poems, one brief and one longer, one old, Yeats, and one um, very new, uh, Eamon Wall, a poet who um, lives in uh, St. Louis now. 
and uh, grew up in Enniscorthy in the uh, Wexford area in the southeast of Ireland. Um, this uh, poem by Yeats is one that many people know. It won't come as a surprise. It's the Song of Wandering Angus. And um, it says, uh, I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped a berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. So um, I really love this poem. I love, first of all, the fact that um, this is a, a poem about um, failure. It's a person who longs for love and never gets it. And yet, with these last lines, kiss her lips, take her hands, pluck these silver apples, these golden apples, it's as if language gives us that culmination, gives us that um, resolution, as if, if you can imagine it, if you can imagine perfection, then it doesn't matter that you didn't achieve it. I also love this, I went out to the Hazelwood because a fire was in my head. Like, what kind of explanation is that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. right, and um, the, uh, when he, in the Irish cottage down on the floor by the hearth, goes to blow the fire aflame. That fire is the fire in his head too, mm -hmm. the magical fire that he, the fire of inspiration, I guess you'd say. Um, so I, I love this poem. Um, this um, poem by Eamon Wall is called Sailing Lake Mariatus. And I, um, I was reading this to myself earlier today to s because it is long, to see how long it would take. And it took about six minutes. So I'm not going to. We have time. We have time? OK, <laughs> well, then maybe I will. Then maybe I will. So I, I was going to excerpt it, but I'll go ahead with it. I'll say um, Lake Mariatus is in Egypt. And this does not begin in Ireland either. In fact, Ireland is scarcely mentioned in it. The Saturday world glides as I look towards Seth Child Road. I am eating breakfast at Panera Bread, plain bagel, coffee in a paper cup. Throughout the cafe and parking lot this bright late October morning, homecomers in wildcat purple are assembling in great numbers to rehearse the K-State battle song. In a little while, breakfast over with, boozy tailgate parties winding down, a momentous battle greater than Agincourt will take place. The homecoming football game is scheduled for early afternoon at Bill Snyder Family Football Stadium. Kansas State Wildcats versus the Cyclones of Iowa State. I am in Manhattan, Kansas, the Little Apple, this weekend to visit my youngest child who is a student here. Loyal to a T, I have pinned my hopes on the Kansas State football team through the inner workings, uh, excuse me, though the inner workings of the game are a source of some confusion to me. This is the middle of the Flint Hills, a sacred place as I have learned from Prairie Earth at the center of a vast and confusing country called the United States of America. Rest assured that I am a citizen, though when I say this to people, they do not tend to heed me. The hills roll gently here. There's an ease in how the local people walk. The air is crisp. The light is fixed and fine. A country person myself, I find myself among my own kind. On my way here this morning, I saw a coyote wandering the edge of a cut cornfield. Exiting the cafe by the rear door, I cross the parking lot to join a group of men and women gathered in front of a row of dumpsters to which the title of Midwest Waste has been conferred. They are all drinking. 
some coffee from paper cups, others soda pop from aluminum cans. After presenting my credentials, immigrant from Ireland, they smile, relax, resume their conversations. I join a man from Honduras. We speak of home, family, work, green cards, homeland security raids. When I note that there exists no such person in my view as the illegal alien, he does not disagree. Three women joined a group on break from work, a Filipino, a Bosnian, and an older woman from Quito, Ecuador, who is given a red milk crate to sit down on. Her husband is a roofing company supervisor, she tells me, while she herself has been making Mexican tacos these 27 years in Kansas and Missouri. Finding a second crate, I seat myself beside Maria Dolores Suarez. She explains how in ancient times, more than is the case today, Lake Mariatis separated Alexandria from Egypt, and that Alexandria, as Michael Hogg has pointed out, was odd and not in Egyptum. That is, it was to Egypt, it was not in Egypt. She recounts for me sundry facts concerning the history of the area that surrounds Alexandria, points out how the lake itself was degraded, drained, and then brought back to life, at least to some degree, in recent times. Many of the terms she provides I have not heard of and therefore do not understand. Mox, Kingdom of the Harpoon, Tehenu, and Naucratus are a few I can recall. No, I reply to her query, I have not heard of St. Menas. I fill my pipe another time. An old sailor settled in Quito as far away from the sea as he could be would sit after dinner with my father in the white courtyard at our building's core. As they smoked their cigars, the sailor often spoke of Egypt. A child, Maria Dolores recalls, I sat in the shadows listening, my job to fetch coffee when my father raised an arm. As immigrants, Maria Dolores Suarez says to me, we pass our lifetimes sailing Lake Mariatis. On a light craft, each of us has left Alexandria for Egypt. Lake Mariatis is vibrant, stretching far away towards distant sands. We approach the mainland without ever arriving. On our approach, the land affects the smoothest of turns away from us. We are in the United States. It is undeniable, though we are not of it. As a wise man wrote not so long ago, no matter where we settle, we will all go gray, walking along our childhood avenues. Both the Alexandria we have departed from and the Egypt we approach are visible and lighted. However, we do not ever exit Lake Mariatis, Mar Maria Dolores Suarez concludes. A man bearing a television set emerges from the rear of Wendy's. Behind him, a long electric cable stretches back into his place of employment. He is greeted fondly by the gathered crowd. When he has settled it properly on top of a dumpster, the new arrival turns the television on. A reprise of the recent El Clasico from the Barnabeo is about to commence. Real Madrid versus Barcelona. Look, Maria Dolores Suarez from Quito, Ecuador, shouts to her two lady companions. There's my man, sexy Javier Mascherano from Argentina. <laughs> we watch the game together quietly, intently, called back onto a familiar stage a warm curtain drawn between us and the United States. Throwing my cup into the dumpster, I wave goodbye and take the longer route round to the front entrance of Panera Bread and once there hold the door for a long, time of, uh, long line of exiting Wildcat fans. To a man, woman, and child, they are happy, warm, friendly, purple, and appreciative of my quiet gesture. <laughs> You're welcome, I say, and good luck against Iowa State today. In the cafe, I order two hot breakfasts to go for my wife and daughter, who will surely have woken up by now. Go Wildcats. So um, I, I want to point out first that this poem has nothing to do with the Yeats poem. They're about as far apart as you could be. That Yeats poem is so musical. It rhymes so insistently. It's so delicate, so mysterious. This is not delicate. It's Panera. It's people sitting around a dumpster watching a television set that's hooked up inside <laughs> a Wendy's. But there's also a way that that metaphor of Lake Mariatis, of never getting all the way across, of always going to Egypt, 
never being in Egypt, of never being in the United States, always being just going there, that that is exactly the circumstance of Yeats's poem, that you always yearn for love, you always learn, yearn for acceptance, you always yearn for perfection, and you never reach it. That's the human condition. But it's also the condition of the immigrant. And I love the way that this becomes this philosophical discussion. I love the part where he writes, um, Eamon Wall writes, an old sailor would sit after dinner with my father. And at that point, we assume that it's Eamon Wall speaking. But really, it's Maria Dolores Suarez speaking. And so it's like all of these immigrants become the same person, um, bound together by real football. Yeah. Well, when I was listening to you, I thought that was really more authentically Irish. Because authentic in the sense that when one thinks of, you know, you know Ireland for a good while was really didn't have a reading public, so much mm -hmm. of it was oral tradition. Yeah, speaking. And I was thinking of this as, you know, here is another tale yes. that's being told and, you know, captivating people, yes. you know, with this, uh, with this, with this yarn. So I've, while it was about a different subject, I said this is very much Ireland yeah. and very much Irish yeah. in the Irish tradition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Will you read one of your own? Um, I, let's hear uh, Van okay. Bolen first. Uh, okay. Sometime in yes. the future, maybe I will. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, um, the good woman is in here somewhere. <laughs> uh, so, um, I already spoke to this, so I won't try to introduce the poem. I think it'll speak for itself. Uh, even Boland, it's called Domestic Violence. <clears throat> It was winter, lunar, wet. At dusk, pewter seedlings became moonlight orphans. Pleased to meet you and meet to please you, said the butcher's sign in the window in the village. Everything changed the year that we got married. And after that, we moved out to the suburbs. How young we were, how ignorant, how ready to think the only history was our own. And there was a couple who quarreled in the, into the night, their voices high, sharp. Nothing is ever entirely right in the lives of those who love each other. In that season, suddenly our island broke out its old sores for all to see. We saw them too. We stood there wondering how the salt horizons and the Dublin hills the rivers, table mountains, Viking marshes we thought we knew had been made to shiver into our ancient 12 by 15 television, which gave them back as gray and grayer tears and killings, 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 then moonlight colored funerals. Nothing we said, not then, not later, fathomed what it is is wrong in the lives of those who hate each other. And if the provenance of memory is only that, remember, not a tone. And if I can be safe in the weak spring light in that kitchen, then why is there another kitchen, spring light always darkening in it, and a woman whispering to a man over and over, what else could we have done? We failed our moment, or our moment failed us. The times were grand in size, and we were small. Why do I write that when I don't believe it? We lived our lives, were happy, stayed as one. Children were born and raised here and are gone, including ours. As for that couple, did we ever find out who they were and did we want to? I think we know. I think we always knew. Hmm. You want to read some more? Yeah. Yes. Um, so these are, I'm just going to read two shorter ones that just touch on my own experience. Uh, one is uh, Patrick Cavanaugh, who um, 
you know, as we were describing earlier, the, the, um, the connection to the land is definitely huge in Kavanaugh's poetry. And we were able to go to the, his place, you know, when we were in Ireland. And um, towards the end of our trip, we were in Derry and we were, uh, we'd gone into a pub <laughs> and went out looking for something to eat and we ended up in this cafe, um, the only place open late uh, and ate chip bap, which neither of us knew what it was, you know, when we <laughs> ordered it. And there was this old gentleman in a, in a, in a suit uh, who struck up a conversation and I have to say, the farther north we got, the harder it was to understand people. And I didn't quite understand everything he said. I thought he was telling me his name was Patty Kavanaugh. But then he uh, recited this poem by, by heart mm -hmm. to me, which was um, the poem called Peace. Uh, and mind you, we were surrounded by these free dairy murals right in the midst of where all the troubles mm -hmm. had occurred. And here's old Patty Kavanaugh, as I came to think of him, reciting this poem. <clears throat> Peace. And sometimes I am sorry when the grass is growing over the stones in quiet hollows and the cock's foot leans across the rutted cart path. That I am not the voice of country fellows who now are standing by some headland talking of turnips and potatoes or young corn, of turf banks stripped for victory. Here, peace is still hawking his colored combs and scarves and beads of horn. Upon a headland by a whinny hedge, a hare sits looking down a leaf-lapped furrow. There's an old plow upside down on a weedy ridge, and someone is shouldering home a saddle harrow. Out of that childhood country, what fools climb to fight with tyrants, love and life and time. Mm -hmm. Matt, do you want to recite another poem for us? We have time. Um, sure. Do we have time to hear another um, Irish one? Oh, absolutely. That sounds Whatever good you to want. Me. That's. Well. Hmm. Sure. Um, this is a poem by Sinead Morrissey, who teaches at Queens Belfast now. is one of the best regarded poets in Ireland at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and um, let's see, yeah, I think this one is maybe easier to understand. It's called the Coal Jetty. So a place where in the past coal would be dumped off so that it could be loaded onto ships to provide steam, the Coal Jetty. Twice a day, whether I'm lucky enough to catch it or not, the sea slides out as far as it can go, and the shore coughs up its crockery. Rocks, muscle banks, beach glass, the horizontal chimney stacks of sewer pipes, crab shells, pi bike spokes. As though a floating house fell out of the clouds as it passed the city limits. Belfast bricks, the kind that also built the factories and the gas works, litter the beach. Most of the landing jetty for coals been washed away by storms. What stands, a section of platform with sky on either side, is home now to guillemots and comorants who call up the ghosts of 19th century hauliers with their blackened beaks and wings. At the lowest ebb, even the scum at the rim of the waves can't reach it. We've been down here before, after dinner, picking our way over mud flats and jellyfish to the five spiked hallways underneath, spanned like a viaduct. There's the stink of rust and salt of cooped up water just released to its wider element. What's left is dark and quiet, barnacles, bladder rack, brick, but bookended by light as when Dorothy opens her dull cabin door and what happens outside is technicolor. <laughs> so I love the combination here of this really ugly part of the city. <laughs> Any of us who have spent time at a, a pier know that stink, know that, uh, yeah, it's true here in Philadelphia too. Mm -hmm. But um, to, to think about how 
the gorgeousness of nature is always there, ready to surprise. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I th I really love to read this. Uh, <laughs> I think I'll just take the second part of this uh, Seamus Heaney okay. poem, which we really must hear Heaney tonight, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, We're giving the men some re representation tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's the second part of a poem called To a Dutch Potter in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And uh, this section is called After Liberation. Mm -hmm. um, so it it really refers to uh, a Dutch man's experience during the war <coughs> and the aftermath. Um, so I think, uh, I wonder if there's time, I'm there's looking time. at the clock, to there's read time. the whole thing. Sure. Mm -hmm. Because I think it really is better to read from the beginning. Um, sorry. To a Dutch potter in Ireland, for Sonia Landveer, and there's an epigram, uh, epigraph. Then I entered a strong room of vocabulary where words like urns that had come through the fire stood in their bone dry alcoves next to kiln and came away changed like the guard who'd seen the stone move in a diamond blaze of air or the gates of horn behind the gates of clay. The soils I knew ran dirty river sand was the one clean thing that stayed itself in that slabbery, clabbery, wintry, puddled ground until I found band clay like wet daylight or viscous satin under the felt and freeze of humus layers, the true diamante, discovered in a little sucky hold, salt hole Gray blue, dull shining, scentless, touchable, like the earth's old ointment box, sticky and cool. At that stage, you were swimming in the sea or running from it, luminous with plankton, a nymph of phosphor by the Nordic Z, a vestal of the goddess Silica, she who's under grass and glass and ash in the fiery heartlands of Ceramica. We might have known each other then in that cold gleam life underground and off the water, weird turns of puddle, paddle, pit a pat, and might have done the small forbidden things, work at mud pies or gone too high on swings, played secrets in the hedge or touching tongues, but did not in the terrible event. Night after night instead in the Netherlands, he watched the bombers kill. Then heaven sent, came back lit from the fire through war and wartime, and ever after, every blessed time, through glazes of fired quarry and iron and lime. And if glazes, as you say, bring down the sun, your potter's wheel is bringing up the earth. Hosanna ex infernus, burning wells. Hosanna in clean sand and kaolin, and now that the rye crop waves beside the ruins in ash pots, oxides, shards, and chlorophylls after liberation. Sheer, bright, shining spring, spring as it used to be, cold in the morning, but as broad daylight swings open, the everlasting sky is a marvel to survivors. In a pearly clarity that bathes the fields, things as they were come back. Slow horses plow the fallow war. Slow horses plow the fallow. War rumbles away in the near distance. To have lived it through and now be free to give utterance, body and soul, to wake and know every time that it's gone and gone for good, the thing that nearly broke you. It's worth it all, the five years on the rack the fighting back, the being resigned, and not one of the unborn will appreciate freedom like this ever. Turning tides, their irregularities. What is the heart that it ever was afraid, knowing as it must know, spring's release? Shining heart, heart constant as a tide. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
Dr. Gorgeous. Yeah. Well, thank you both <laughs> for being our guest tonight on Philly Loves Poetry. You really represent it. <laughs> Irish poetry pretty well in the space of this this hour so I, I really appreciate that um, I want to say to our audience our viewing audience is that of course this program comes about through the Moonstone Arts Center and Moonstone sponsors over 80 poetry events during the year in addition to publishing uh, poetry books uh, chat books and full poetry but understand that um, to be able to do this, we need the support of the community. Uh, so I say to you, if you, you see what Moonstone brings uh, to our audiences, these two really wonderful, remarkable poets, is that we need your support. So, and you can do that by going on to our website, www.moonstoneartscenter.org, and you can find out how you can provide that support the other thing is, of course, I mentioned Natalie as a listserv, and I, I don't think everybody knows about it, but it's a valuable resource to find out about what's happening in poetry in Philadelphia, because you share your, uh, the, yeah. uh, the, the address? Yes. Um, it's always hard to share an address over the, over the air, um, <laughs> but it's N, as in nut, <laughs> A-N-D-E-R-S, as the first letters of Anderson, N. Anders, Nanders, numeral one, at, <coughs> excuse me, Swarthmore, S-W-A-R-T-H-M-O-R-E dot E-D-U. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you Very for good. that. <laughs> the other thing I, uh, as coming up on, and I, I read uh, purposely uh, a Walt Whitman poem uh, tonight because in April and May, Philly Loves Poetry is going to be dedicated to uh, Walt Whitman and to the festival uh, Whitman at 200, which is really, go it, it is and it's going to be really a celebration of the 200th anniversary birthday of uh, this very storied poet who, you know, spent his last years in, in Camden. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, that's really remarkable. So I will have guests that are really the sponsors uh, of and have helped organize uh, uh, Whitman 200, as well as poets uh, that will come and read you know, poems, both of Whitman and their own poems. So stay tuned for that in April and May. They should be really incredible shows. So I want to once again thank you so much for you know, sharing this you know, wonderful poetry with us. I have a, you know, a sure prejudice <laughs> toward uh, this, uh, this poetry. I might just say, my, when people say, well, Charles, what is one of your, your favorite poems? I think it's uh, um, Haney's Rub All Man. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, mm -hmm. whole, that whole sequence, I guess it's partially because uh, my wife's a Dane and mm -hmm. much of you know what he found was you know uh, from our Viking past, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know his uh, his uh, description, his way of boring down on the on the details in mm -hmm. every way is just uh, amazing. So uh, maybe sometime I'll read that. But uh, tonight, uh, I once again thank you, and I want to thank the crew here. You do a great job to make this happen, and I'm so grateful to you mm -hmm. for your patience. <laughs> 